Hello again, everyone. It's Dr. Matt again from the University of Pennsylvania. Really appreciate you guys hanging with us this whole day. I know it's been a long day, but we appreciate it. And hopefully these cases will keep you somewhat entertained. We're going to talk about cases, outcomes, and non-invasive healing in the time of COVID-19 uh, or currently, uh, since we're sort of living it right now. Um, I really have, uh, these are my disclosures and these are the learning objectives. Um, we're going to review the evolution of surgical treatment in the context of COVID-19, outline some risk mitigation strategies of preventing non-union, which we talked a little bit about earlier, if you remember my previous presentation, and then look at some really complex and relatively non-complex cases and real application in lipis and in non-invasive healing, especially in the setting of COVID-19. So I will tell you that this is a new paradigm for me. You know, this is um, one of my first sessions uh, doing um, uh, telemedicine, which is even for an orthopedic trauma and fracture practice. You think, how are you doing telemedicine? Uh, we have figured it out. We've had to figure it out. And, and I, you know, I'll start by saying that we, we looked at doing telemedicine in orthopedics in our department for some time pre COVID. We were really working on how do we do telemedicine. We had some pilots we wanted to try in the department. And there were always issues pre-COVID, pre-March, pre-February. Um, uh, uh, you know, we did, I did a couple of visits. But the conversation was, well, how do I get this to flow during my regular clinic day? I've got 40 patients scheduled. Where did this fit in? How do I do it without affecting my the rest of my day? You know, how do we how are we going to do cost control and cost management, like with with respect to um, uh, you know device, like if we have to put a brace on a patient, uh, or we're going to um, you know bill for my time or services, you know um, how do we get the tech right? My technology, am I going to use my laptop, my phone? What about the other patient? What platform we're going to use? Is it HIPAA compliant? Are patients really going to like it? Are patients going to really, you know, are they going to be able to do it? Are they going to, you know, are we going to miss things? Um, how are we going to bill for it? Well, billing at the time for telemedicine, there was none. Uh, this is uh, uh, only a, a recent event uh, where CMS ruled that you could bill for telemedicine like you could bill for an in-person visit if you met certain things. But the biggest sort of red flag or the biggest concern for me was quality of care. Uh, are we going to really be able to provide the same quality of care to our patients who are having um, uh, uh, telemedicine as opposed to those that come in in terms of being able to put our hands on them, being able to look at x-rays? How are we going to get x-rays, right? So all these things really um, uh, changed uh, my approach uh, I had to change my, I, I had to change my approach because if I didn't, I wouldn't be seeing patients because we shut everything down for several months. Uh, and we can talk more about COVID if you have questions in our sort of response and how we've sort of resurged after or now uh, in the light of sort of a, a change in our approach. But I will tell you that telemedicine has definitely improved access to us. It is extremely convenient for the patients and frankly, for me as the provider, uh, and I do believe that for some patients, it has really improved their patient satisfaction. So I will tell you that COVID-19 had an impact on patients with fracture care. This is a woman who came to see me right before things really got crazy with COVID in our area. So probably very early, mid-March, she came to see me. She had an ankle fracture. She had suffered it, you know, and was treated outside hospital initially with just a, a, a splint and a, and a cast and you know, she started to fail. And I had had a long talk with her about what we needed to do to fix her. And we scheduled her for surgery late March to, to reconstruct her because she was relatively still fresh. This woman, because of COVID, chose not to come in for her surgery. She canceled the morning of saying she was afraid of COVID. She didn't know what her hospital numbers looked like. She wanted to do more research into the hospital and into our managing our COVID patients, et cetera. And she canceled her surgery. She lived like this until about a month ago. So for three months, she let herself sort of heal in this position. And it made her subsequent surgery that much more challenging. Not to mention the fact that she walked on her leg crooked like this for three months because of her fear of COVID and her, her concerns. Not that they're not um, uh, appropriate, 
but it just can show you the mindset of some of the patients that despite this, what looks like a fairly graphic and horrific injury, which it is, frankly, I mean, this is not a normal ankle and she clearly knew it wasn't right. She was walking on the side of her foot, but she, she made the decision to live like this and let us deal with the consequences. And, we'll, and we are seeing more of that. We are seeing patients even now who chose not to seek treatment and if you talk to some of our emergency medical providers, they will tell you that they were picking up patients who are far sicker um, because of COVID. Patients, patients, patients and their families weren't calling EMS when patients were having cardiac issues or pulmonary issues, hoping they would get better because they were, that, they were afraid of going to the hospital. Um, so I think um, this is not an uncommon scenario, and it's something that we're seeing now. Um, and this is where I think something like telemedicine early engagement, safe practices make a huge difference. Um, you know, we had this mantra, we heal with steel. That's the orthopedic trauma mantra. You add some 316L stainless steel or some titanium, and you can take something like this and make it look like this, and eventually it will heal. And that may be true if you're actually getting to see and treat patients physically. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. And so we had to come up with a little bit of a paradigm shift in terms of some of these patients, which we may have treated operatively or could have treated operatively, but now we're being essentially forced to treat non-operatively because we were treating them via telemedicine and there was limited to no access of them coming to the hospital. And so when you think about um, all these sort of biologic treatments that enhance bone healing, the one thing about all these treatments is they require an in-person engagement. They require in-person treatment, and they require us to be physically in the operating room with these patients. The one that doesn't is something like lipus, right? So something like a low-intense pulse ultrasound, um, we, you know, what we use here, um, does not require uh, us to be physically with the patient. We can prescribe this. We work closely with our uh, uh, our consultants who prescribe these devices or, or, or deliver these devices to patients, with these can be delivered remotely. Those pa the, the device service reps can then engage with the patients remotely and be able to deliver this kind of care without actually having to be physically with them or in the operating room or in the clinic, putting them at risk. And so it is one of the few things that we can do that can enhance fracture healing that doesn't require in-person treatment. So this is a patient of mine. Uh, he was um, drag racing and crashed his car. Uh, we treated him with an intramedullary device. Um, we did a, he also needed a free flap. Uh, so you can see here the soft tissue defect, the muscle we had to move, and then um, soft tissue coverage. And this is him at three months. Um, I saw him in the office and he was going on to a non-union. You can see he wasn't healing. Now, what's interesting about this patient is that um, he is, he, well, he's, he himself is young. He lives with two immunocompromised people. And so when we saw him, we talked about some things we could do for him, injecting bone marrow aspirate into the fracture site, dynamizing the rod, trying to do something surgically to get him to heal. Unfortunately, he did not want to do anything that involved him coming anywhere near the hospital. Uh, and so for him, even though he was three months and he wasn't healing, we didn't have a lot of options that, aside from doing something like lipus or giving him more time. And so ultimately the patient chose to do something rather than nothing, because more time is really nothing. And we put him on lipus and you can see that on his x-rays, which he obtained remotely at four and a half months, he's now gone on to union. So we got him his lipus device at three months, and by four and a half months, he's made some really, really good bone uh, in that same fracture. And this treatment was 100% was dictated by lipus, or by COVID. I would argue that if it wasn't for COVID, I probably would have taken this patient to the operating room and either dynamized him or injected him with some bone marrow aspirate to get him to heal. Uh, so um, his treatment, frankly, uh, was improved, if you will, because of COVID, and we, were, we could treat him non-operatively. This is an unfortunate woman. Um, she is very elderly. She is, um, uh, has multiple medical comorbidities. She um, had a high blood glucose sugar and fell and broke her ankle. And this is, by all stretch of the imagination, typically an operative fracture. 
You can see the, um, the displaced fibula here. You can see the widening of the medial side. Um, this is an unstable ankle by definition. She's 80 years old, like I said, multiple medical problems. We put, we got her reduced. We have residents did a great job reducing her in the emergency room. So she's now well aligned. Um, she absolutely would not come back to the hospital for a treatment or the clinic. Um, even for me to be able to treat her with, um, with uh, a cast or to get her uh, uh, even treated non-operatively. Everything had to be done via telemedicine and her nephew helped coordinate the telemedicine visits. What do we do with her? Because I got, she's 80 years old, she's high risk, you know, she wants to walk. It's really hard to keep an 80 year old non weight bearing. I can't put her in a cast because she won't come in. I can't, um, I, I can't treat her surgically, which is what I typically would do for an, a fracture pattern like this. So after really sort of a, a long conversation, we kept her in the splint for three weeks. At three weeks, her nephew took her, who all, is an LPN, so has some medical knowledge, took her out of the splint. We shipped them through our DME provider, a medical, a, a, a fracture boot or a cam boot. She maintained her non-weight bearing and I put her on lipus. I got her a lipus device for her ankle fracture um, so that she could start treatment with that to get her accelerated fracture healing. This is her at her eight week, I wanna say appointment. It's her eight week x-ray. She's out of the boot. She is starting to heal her fracture. She's been putting weight on it for now for two weeks, despite my one not wanting her to do that. And she's starting to lay down bone. And so again, another patient who we had to find a way to treat conservatively, high risk patient treated with lipus and conservative care. Ankle looks okay. It is not perfect, but she's 80, multiple medical comorbidities. And her desire was to not come into the hospital. <clears throat> this is a patient AT. He got injured right at the beginning of spring sports. So like first week of March, he was running um, down first down to first base after hitting the ball and his tibia snapped underneath him. Um, he had com been complaining of pain in his leg for some time. He thought it was just shin splints. Turns out it was likely a stress fracture. We took him to the operating room and we put a rod down his leg. At three months, so uh, about two months ago, he came in continuing to have pain. Now his parents are very engaged and involved with him. He's an excellent baseball player. He's a D1 or D2 recruit, but you can see this fracture line is clearly present and uh, there. And when I say came in, we were doing everything uh, via telemedicine. His parents live in the suburbs with him. Um, and, uh, you know, he didn't, they didn't want to drive all the way in. Uh, he was referred to us for his treatment uh, because of his uh, age and because of the mechanism of injury. People thought it was really weird. They thought it was cancer. So he was transferred down to us from uh, a, an area that's, that's not close. So that's the other thing that telemedicine and COVID has allowed us to do is we've been able to expand our uh, footprint in terms of where we take care of patients. Anyhow, this patient is now three months. They live a distance away. Um, he's not he is healing, but he's healing very slowly, and he's already showing signs of what looks like a non-union. It smells like a non-union. It looks like a non-union. If you remember our talk earlier, uh, you know, not everything sometimes fits the definition, but this person who's otherwise healthy, no medical problems, they are not a smoker, they're, they're in better shape than I am, and most of us are. Um, he's, you know, 16-year-old athlete, uh, clearly uh, problematic. Well, um, of note, the patient lives with their grandmother um, at their home. We talked about doing some kind of revision surgery, either a new nail or dynamization or um, uh, some kind of bone marrow injection into the fracture site, all of which are very reasonable things to do. Um, again, similar to that first case I showed you with the patient who uh, lives with two immunocompromised patients, you know, the family really wanted to do something but didn't want to have to be seen physically. They've been doing a lot of social distancing uh, in terms of the care of their uh, family. And so he has this non-union. You can see how hypertrophic it is. It's not healed. Even though it might look healed on this picture, it is a hypertrophic non-union. Uh, it clearly, you can see the fracture line all the way across in this picture. 
We put him on lipus, and that's him at four and a half months, right? He didn't change anything he did. He continued his activity. He wasn't doing physical therapy. He didn't increase his vitamin D input. Uh, he simply added lipus to his care to avoid coming downtown uh, to have us see him, and he went on to heal. And I actually, after his last visit, discharged him all electronically. So I saw him, I did his surgery, saw him once in person after his surgery to take his stitches out, which is right when COVID sort of started. And then after that, never saw him again other than via telemedicine. But we got him to Union, and we got him to Union by doing it all remotely. Um, and that was great. This is a patient, he's an extremely active biker, and this is how he's been getting through COVID. Uh, he bikes a lot, flipped over his handlebars, sustained this far distal clavicle fracture, um, type A personality, was, was absolutely um, uh, uh, bent on getting back on his bike. That's how he was coping. And that's one of the things that I will say that we've seen with a lot of patients. They are doing things that they don't normally do or doing more of what they normally do as a coping mechanism and some of the mental health issues we're seeing in, our, in, in and around um, patients who have uh, or are managing through a COVID epidemic. Um, so for him, it was really important to get really active really fast. I'm sorry about the grainy in, uh, issue of this picture. I did see him once in person because he was so distraught, thought he needed surgery. We gave him a low intensity pulse ultrasound device. And uh, eight weeks later, no pain in his shoulder. He was back on the bike four weeks after his injury. And at eight weeks, I discharged him again via telemedicine. Um, and he did and felt great, full range of motion, no pain over his shoulder, and what I consider a relatively high risk uh, fracture to go on to a non union. So, JH is a patient that came to see me um, probably uh, late, it was, I think it was late around Halloween, so it was late October, early November. He had an open segmental tibia fracture. Um, you can see the open wound he has here. You can see the bone that's sticking out. You can see the fracture line through the bone that he has. It's a fairly large traumatic wound um, and it's a fairly significant fracture. Uh, this is his x-rays and they show that segmental open tibia fracture. Um, JH is also what I would consider a high-risk patient. So he has an open 3A tibia fracture. He also has a substance abuse history, um, and he also is an active smoker. And so we took him to the operating room emergently that evening because of the severity of his injury. Um, we were able to take him to the operating room and debride his wound. That's that segment of bone that just sort of came out, and you can see how large that segment of bone is. And that's a huge defect to fill in especially given some of his comorbidities. Um, I chose to fix him that evening because everything was relatively clean and I got a good debridement. I reinserted that piece of bone in an effort to try and get um, good alignment. So that piece of bone keys in and gives me the ability to uh, get everything perfect. So that's why instead of throwing it away, which is what we typically do with a segment of bone like that, I chose to keep it and then definitively fix him. My thought was I would keep it, I would definitively fix him, and then eventually take that bone out before I closed him so that I didn't have a dead piece of bone in his tibia. And so you can see here on these x-rays, I used that bone, I keyed it in, I used some small plates to kind of hold everything together. I put my rod down the tibia, and then I took those plates off. And I was really excited because the fracture looked fantastic when I was done. The problem was that by the time I put my rod in, and because of the alignment of the fracture and how everything keyed together, that piece of bone keyed in beautifully, and it wasn't moving. I would have to have taken a saw to cut that bone out. So now I've got this patient who has an open fracture with a traumatic wound, with a dead piece of bone in, 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 as an intercalary segment, who is a smoker with some risk factors for not healing. Tremendous, right? <laughs> um, so that's what his wound looked like. So I was able to get a primary wound closure, which was good, but still doesn't ch change the fact that he's high risk. And, then, and this is him at six months. And I saw him at six months, and frankly, he, he wasn't feeling. Um, you know, he was still symptomatic. Uh, and I discussed with him, because I knew that was a dead piece of bone, I discussed with him the need to take this bone out. 
Now, at this point, we're in the throes of the COVID epidemic, but we are allowed to operate on patients who we feel need to have surgery or should have surgery or are symptomatic. Um, it requires some special permission, but it also required all patients getting a COVID test preoperatively, and that's part of one of our risk mitigation strategies. Unfortunately, this patient, we, because of a variety of social issues, we could not get this patient coordinated to take a COVID test. Yeah, he, we just couldn't do it. But I couldn't leave him untreated. And so we were able to get him a lifeless device so that we could do something for him until we could sort out how to manage his non-union. So we got him a lifeless device and uh, via remotely, all done remotely, uh, he was able to engage in telemedicine. And by nine months, we were able to get him to union. Um, and ultimately I had to take him back and fix his fibula for different reasons, but I didn't have to touch his tibia at all. His tibia healed completely uneventfully uh, with the lipus uh, only three months later. And then eventually we were able to get him a COVID test and I could take back and fix his ankle, which was different than his tibia. But you can see that dead bone with lipus incorporated beautifully uh, without me having to do anything surgical for him. So uh, again, another case where um, you know COVID uh, uh, dictated our treatment to some degree, um, and we were able to get this patient conservatively managed for his fracture that wasn't healing. So we talk about non-unions. What I'll leave you with is uh, my top ten list from top from bottom to top. Uh, I think when we talk about fractures and complex injuries, you have to be data driven. Um, Think about the data, think about who's at risk, look at the data and, and think about what you wanna do and how you wanna do it. Principles-based treatment is really important. Think about principles of fracture fixation and fracture healing, principles of patient management. I think there's lots of options that exist, both operative and non-operative options. And I think you have to make sure patients know this. You also have to think about what fits in with what you're doing and how you're doing it. I also think it's important to remember what the host brings to the table in these complex fractures. What's their vitamin D level, thyroid, parathyroid? How do they look and what do they, what do they do metabolically to optimize their fracture healing? I think you also have to do what makes sense. I shared a few cases with you in terms of what I would have thought to do operatively, but in this setting that we were in, it made sense to try something else like lipus. There are non-invasive options to fracture healing. And I think, you know, we, we tend to, in North America in particular, get very aggressive with surgical treatment. And I am reminded with some of the developing nation work that I do is non-operative treatment or conservative treatment or non-invasive treatment is just as, and sometimes more effective than operative treatment. Host factors are really important and managing those host factors is really important in terms of taking care of patients. When you think about things like low intensity pulse ultrasound, one of the conversations I've had with several of my patients is why not do it, right? If you're not ready for something surgical or if surgical treatment is not an option for a variety of reasons, COVID withstanding, then why not try something else that's not going to negatively affect fracture healing? And the last thing I'm, I'm reminded by, and COVID has really done this for me, is Conservative treatment for fracture care does work when you have and are able to manage and track your patients. And between telemedicine and COVID, we've really been able to re revigorize um, a conservative management of certain kinds of fractures. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate it and I'm happy to take questions. Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, I know you guys have had a uh, long day, but we appreciate you um, hanging with us. Uh, hopefully it's been educational for the group. Uh, and this is gonna be our uh, final Q&A for the session. And so I'm happy to answer not just questions about this session, but other questions that you might have that may have come up uh, during the session. If I can't answer them, obviously. Um, the first question um, is about emergency surgery. Uh, do we wait until COVID-19 test results come back? It usually takes about four to five days. 
Uh, actually, at our institution, we have a rapid COVID test that every trauma patient and emergency patient gets. The rapid COVID test comes back in about 45 minutes. Um, the, uh, if you're at an institution where you don't have a rapid COVID test and you need to perform emergency surgery, uh, the recommendation is that you proceed as if the patient is COVID positive. Um, so for example, uh, recently we had a patient who came in after a motorcycle crash with a mangled extremity and a dysvascular limb. It was a, it was a now type case. Uh, we did not have time to wait the requisite 45 minutes even for the rapid test. Uh, so we took the patient to the operating room and we have a COVID designated operating room in our hospital. The COVID designated operating room has to be laminar flow uh, or not laminar flow, negative pressure flow so that uh, the air can be um, circulated appropriately and, and removed appropriately. Uh, after, uh, as we started the surgery, inappropriate PPE for that kind of surgery, we discovered that his rapid test came back positive. So uh, again, a reminder that you don't know what you are dealing with until um, you uh, are in the midst of it sometimes. Uh, this morning, in fact, I had a patient who came in last night with an open fractured ankle dislocation after a motorcycle crash. We got the rapid COVID test last night uh, and were, were able to determine that he was COVID positive and was placed into our COVID room, which we can schedule into as well for urgent for emergent surgeries that, are, uh, that require um, uh, appropriate PPE. But in general, if you have an emergency surgery that you have to perform and cannot wait for the COVID results or the COVID results will not come back in an appropriate level of time, but care is necessary for that patient, whether it's life or limb threatening, um, then you should proceed uh, and we proceed with uh, universal precautions, assuming the patient is COVID positive. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on COVID or flow uh, since COVID in terms of our resurgence and seeing patients again and uh, protocols, uh, I, I, I've done some work in this area, both uh, at our institution as well as in other organizations I'm part of. And I know there's a lot of questions around COVID and uh, patient management. Uh, the next question is, uh, how is LIPAS provided? Is there a home unit? Does the patient set it up themselves? That's a great question. Um, the the LIPAS units are, uh, patient-oriented or patient-based. They're actually quite easy to use. Um, it's two units uh, or two pieces. One is a piece about the size of an iPhone, and that's the ultrasound or transducer component. Um, uh, and then the second piece is the, uh, the piece that, or the part that activates it, where you press the button and turn it on, and also about the size of an iPhone, and they're correct, connected by a cord. They come in a carrying case with uh, gel, the transducer gel. Um, it's an ultrasound. Um, Patients can be, the device can be shipped out to them uh, prior to COVID. Um, our LIPAS consultant or representative would, would schedule a time to meet with the patient, typically in clinic. We would mark the site of interest that has to be uh, where the LIPAS would be applied. Uh, and then they put the, show them how to use the ultrasound gel, apply the device, which is a Velcro strap. Uh, the device that we use is 20 minutes. And so the patient would press the button. 20 minutes later, the device beeps and they take it off and put it in their case. It should be used daily, 20 minutes a day, seven days a week. So I stress that to my patients that they need to uh, take it with them if they're going on vacation and they should use it about the same time every day. Um, it's relatively easy to use. Um, and as a the healthcare provider, I can actually track their utilization. So if they bring the device to me, I can see how many times they used it. And if they used it, you know, appropriately in that sense that, you know, if they missed a session, did they do two sessions on one day to make it up? Or did they skip a day? You know, how many times did they use it over the course of a, you know, 60 day, 90 day period, that sort of thing. So it's, um, it's fairly easy to use. It's fairly, um, uh, fairly well defined. And uh, the company can uh, talk a patient through setting it up via telemedicine or via tele, like, like we're doing right now, uh, or, uh, you know, direct patient contact, uh, which is how we used to do it prior to COVID. The next question is on, um, do I see a role of telemedicine in fracture care? That's a great question because uh, unlike other specialties, I think there's a little bit more with x-rays uh, and with, um, you know, patient interaction when it comes to fracture care, trying to both not only determine uh, if the fracture is operative or non-operative, but then also you know, bracing and casting and that sort of thing that goes with some fracture care. I think like anything else, um, it's been a little bit of a transition uh, and we were forced to go through that transition um, 
uh, for um, uh, transition for with COVID. Uh, the, um, the the fact was that if if I didn't do telemedicine, I wasn't going to see patients, and so I had to figure out. Uh, uh, we had to figure out. I, I credit my administrative team with this some kind of patient flow perspective. I think the biggest thing that we need from a fracture care perspective is x-rays. And so having the patient obtain those x-rays and then somehow get those images to us, because frankly, we don't necessarily use the radiology reports. We actually wanna see the images in real time or relative real time. And so with digital healthcare, the way it is, um, we set up a workflow where we would send patients a prescription for their, for their x-rays. They would then obtain their x-rays locally, either at a radiology facility or at a local hospital or at an affiliated site to our institution. So I could look at those images electronically. If they got images done at an outside facility, they would either mail the disk to us or we have a cloud server and they would upload the images to a cloud. At that point, uh, this is where I thought the challenge was. Once we got the images, I would do our telemedicine visit. And obviously the technology is uh, a, a challenge as well. I, um, I felt some days more, than, more like an IT consultant than I did a, a physician or the, the, uh, you know, the, the tech line for help services, trying to talk patients through how to use their uh, app, uh, whichever app we were using. We have a, a proprietary app that we use for telecommunications that's HIPAA compliant. And so talking them through the app and having them get connected was part or most of the battle. But after that, you know, it reminds you about the ability and the role of getting a good history and, and being able to, to listen to a patient. And I think that's one of the things that telemedicine has really forced me to do is you're not relying as much on imaging and you're not relying as much on, on um, you know, being able to just manipulate the patient's limb or something like that. Uh, the, um, uh, the, so the history component becomes really important and learning um, and learning and listening to patients again, I think has been tremendous. Um, so it, it is definitely a, a possibility. And I think, you know, the other, the other challenge that we ran into was uh, durable medical goods, like a, if they needed a cast, uh, like a cast shoe or a fracture brace or something like that. And so that's where we've worked with our durable medical goods provider to help get those, that equipment delivered out there. They'll actually go out to the homes and service the home, at the homes because they have regional people that will do that. Uh, but that has definitely been probably the hardest thing is how do you get a patient uh, out of a cast or how do you get a patient a fracture boot if they've got an ankle fracture? Uh, like some of the cases I showed you, how do we get them transitioned? Uh, and it's been working with their family as well to help with that. Some of our older patients are less mobile patients. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's seamless, but it's definitely, um, it's definitely, we've definitely transitioned uh, and are doing it. Um, I think patients also, some patients want to be seen and want, especially when they have an injury, want someone to you know, want the reassurance that it's going, everything's going okay. Um, are there any studies on the use of lipis for stimulating tooth socket repair after bone grafting in preparation for tooth implant? That's a great question. I don't, I don't know, I don't think so. Um, I would tell you that at least in the US, um, that would be an off-label use for lipis. Um, so, uh, but if it's bone, which it is, and you're looking for bone growth and bone regeneration, uh, I would think that um, uh, ultrasound stimulation or mechanical loading, which is what the ultrasound does, as you've probably already heard, uh, would be of, of benefit to mechano stimulation of uh, bone formation. So um, I would say that um, uh, it, uh, probably would work, but I don't have any research to say uh, one way or the other. Uh, how has COVID impacted your use of things like lipus? Um, I definitely have used more lipus with COVID because we have been sort of transitioning away from, uh, or I should say not away from, but definitely doing more non-operative treatment, uh, both uh, from a patient perspective. Patients are sort of wanting to do less right now. Um, I, I would say I have patients who uh, would, and they've said I would pursue fixing this, but I think I'm gonna just not want to come into the hospital. And if you can cast it, that would be great. Or if you can immobilize it and it, you know, if it doesn't heal right, we can always do it later. Uh, and that's true, it's, it makes the job a little bit harder, but yes, that's true. We can always fix something later and do a malunion repair or a non-union repair rather than uh, try and bring somebody in acutely if they're not comfortable doing that. Um, as a result, I have been prescribing more lipis just to get patients to heal a little bit faster, a little bit more um, 
uh, maybe a little bit more aggressively so that uh, they are less likely to lose reduction. Uh, you probably remember seeing that study on distal radius fractures. Uh, if it feels a little bit faster, it's less likely to fail. Uh, failure happens over time as fractures are slow to heal or don't heal. So uh, uh, it has been uh, an adjunct uh, to fracture healing, especially in my high-risk patients or the patients that I'm worried about bringing into the hospital. The other thing that I've done is in our COVID pos positive patients who, are, uh, who we can manage conservatively, um, trying to limit risk to our healthcare providers, we have also tra transitioned those patients to lipus as well so that they can heal a little bit faster so that we can um, avoid exposure uh, to other healthcare providers in our uh, office or in our hospitals. Uh, another question is what's the best way to locate the transducer? That's a great question. Um, in the in the pre-COVID world, uh, we were uh, having patients come into the office. Uh, we would either get an x-ray or use a prior x-ray and we would take a Sharpie pen and put a big X on the, uh, on the spot uh, and show patients then kind of remind patients to mark uh, where they uh, where they should put their um, put their uh, transducer. Uh, now it's a little different because we're not having them come to the office. They are calling, uh, you know, they're getting their device remotely. They're getting talked through how to use it. And so, in that case, what we're doing is we're actually, you know, using telemedicine to our advantage. We I know where their I know what their X-rays look like. I know where that where that is on the bone. So I'm using myself for uh, a model or something to show them and they'll show me with their camera phones or their computers or their iPads, what they're looking at. And we'll, over the phone, talk through exactly where to mark the leg. And once it's marked, um, they're able to use it. In the ideal world, the fracture uh, the, um, transducer is placed directly over the site of the delayed union, non-union fracture. Um, and th that nice thing about the transducer is it can be rotated to that side. Now, the other thing about ultrasound is that it can penetrate through soft tissue and it's, think of it like a, um, like a, a, weight, uh, a ripple in the water. You throw a rock in and there's this ripple effect and the further you get from the, from the impact, the farther the waves sort of spread out. They also have less power as they get further out, but they can, they have a broad reach. And so you don't have to be exact, you just have to be kind of close. Um, so as long as they're close to it, and I typically use the side of the fracture that the, the side the fracture is on uh, where there's less soft tissue. So for instance, with the tibia, I use what's called a pre-tibial eminence. As long as the soft tissue there is okay, that's the part of the tibia that if you ran your fingers down the front of it, you can feel that there's no muscle over it. Um, for the femur, I, you know, it's a, it's a very, sort of circumferentially, uh, circumferential bone with lots of muscle around it. I'll put the transducer in whichever location provides the most direct access to the fracture. Um, and so it really depends on the patient's anatomy, but trying to minimize that distance between transducer and bone. There's another question on uh, any new FDA indications for lipids. Um, right now, I don't know of any new indications other than what you may have already seen during today's presentations. Um, getting new FDA indications for a drug or a device is not an easy task, um, but uh, it is, um, and it requires typically a fairly large investment, um, and I don't know of any new ones right now. Um, I do tend to use it for what, um, for at least lipus, for what some might consider off-label indications sometimes, to get a, get, a, get, a, get a fracture to heal a little bit faster. How can we best ensure that a patient uses a transducer location over time? That's a great question because it's about patient motivation. And um, so there are a couple ways that I uh, encourage patients to do this. The first is that um, when I talk to a patient about using lipus, I tell them up front, if they're not going to use it every day, if they're not going to do it at the, and the device that I use is 20 minutes a day, if they're not going to do it for the prescribed 20 minutes a day, then there's no point in doing it. And let's just be honest with each other. If, if the goal is to get you to heal and you're not going to do this for whatever reason, work, life, schedule, et cetera, then let's just take it off the table, right? So that's, that's the first part of it is a getting a commitment from them that they're going to use it. The other thing I tell them is, you know, we're trying to get your fracture, non-union, malunion, whatever it is to heal. And we're doing this in lieu of doing something operatively. Most of these patients either have undergone surgery or they've been trying to treat something non-operatively because either it doesn't need to be operatively fixed 
or they don't want surgery. And so my motivation for them is if this doesn't work, the next step to get you to heal or the next step to get your fracture fixed appropriately would be something surgical, which might mean essentially starting over, taking rods out, putting new rods in, plating something, bone grafting something, surgical incisions, more pain, et cetera, et cetera. And so as we, as they hear that, if that's not motivation enough, right, then I'm not sure what is in the sense that if we can avoid another surgery, um, then uh, then it could be really good motivation to, to for the patient to, to, to do what they need to do on their end in terms of being compliant with their treatment. Uh, and I think that risk of having another surgery uh, or risking another uh, surgery is sometimes enough motivation to be compliant with treatment. And I think that's uh, that's how I tend to um, motivate my patients is, hey, it's another, if we if we get you to heal, great. And if we don't, you're getting another surgery. So you better just do what you need to do. And, and most patients are actually, when you, when, they, when you put it that way and put it that bluntly, they seem to understand that this is a shot to, to save them from a trip to the operating room. Um, but again, I think it's getting that commitment up front and getting them to say, it's 20 minutes a day, every day. If you can't do it, we shouldn't bother. And you'd be surprised. Some patients say, yeah, I'm, I'm just not, I'm just not that, I'm just not going to do it that, that frequently. Okay. And then let's just, let's not even take, waste our time, both yours and mine. Let's find some other solution to help you, to help get you heal. Um, there are, there are a few questions coming in about COVID uh, and issues related to um, patient care and COVID and how we're doing our clinics. Um, so I, I guess uh, I, I'm sure people have worked out workflows for their COVID patients. Um, and I'm happy to share ours. And I think that's where a few of these questions are going. So I'm going to, I'm going to group those questions together uh, because I think there is a, a lot of still a lot of um, concern uh, around COVID patients and how we should be managing that. So on the inpatient side, I think I described this already, but we assume all patients are COVID positive um, at time of entry into the hospital, the trauma bay or the emergency room. And then we sorted out from there with our rapid COVID test. If we have to do something urgently or emergently, then they are um, treated as COVID positive patients. When we get transfers in from other hospitals, we ask that they have a COVID test prior to transfer. If that's not an option because it's gonna be four or five days and their treatment's gonna be delayed or something like that, then we bring them in as a pa patient under investigation, a PUI, and then we, we test them uh, when they get to our hospital. And then based on how they test, they go into the COVID floor or the non-COVID floor. We do have a separate ward for our COVID patients to minimize exposure to other healthcare providers, pay other patients and their families. Um, we have pretty strict visitation policy, policy still in place in the hospital uh, with respect to single visitors uh, and no back and forth of visitors to and from on the same day. Um, we do do uh, temperature checks when patients come into the hospital and their family, obviously. We are not routinely testing our healthcare providers in terms of whether they are COVID positive or antibody testing them routinely. The outpatient side has been a little bit more interesting because um, we've had to create some workflows to try and minimize our um, time in clinic. And so this is the, one of the questions was about how are we managing our clinic? Um, we are. Um, we, we used to do 10 minute visits, uh, but it was made clear by the health system that they did not want that kind of flow and overlap of patients waiting in radiology or waiting in the waiting room. And so we, we've spread out our visits. Um, we now do 20 minute visits instead of 10. This has naturally created more space, more space on the elevators, more space in radiology, more space in the uh, clinic area uh, in an effort to kind of space those patients out so that there's not a lot of people uh, in the same uh, room. Obviously, we require masks upon entry into the building and at all times in the building. Uh, the other thing that we've deter we've done is we've done everything we can to um, uh, uh, everything we can to um, minimize their in clinic activity. So pre-registration, if there's a copay, prepay of the copay, if they can get x-rays before they come in, getting those images done before they come in. Um, the checkout process has become remote as well. So we'll, we'll check them out electronically, um, trying to limit again that time in the clinic. Um, we try and get a, all our pre-operative testing done or pre-testing uh, pre done in, in by scrubbing the charts so they're, they're, uh, uh, their clinic flow is efficient. 
uh, and then any kind of scheduling. We also have been pretty good about uh, patients that can be telemedicine, we, we make telemedicine. So even if, even if they show up for their first appointment or, or one of their appointments in person, if future appointments can be telemedicine, since we don't know what this is gonna look like three months or six months from now, if their future appointments are gonna be telemedicine or can be, we do that uh, in advance of their next appointment at that appointment. So we tell them it's gonna be telemedicine, we make sure that they're okay with that. And then we have our office schedule that as a telemedicine visit. Um, it has definitely been, there have been some hiccups, technologically some hiccups, um, you know, x-rays not maybe getting done, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, overall, it's been surprisingly good. Our telemedicine slots, at least mine, are 20 minutes as well um, in terms of seeing the patient. And I include that time as well as documentation. Um, the, uh, the other aspect of this uh, is... Um, you know, in terms of signups for surgeries, uh, I actually have signed up patients via telemedicine for surgery. Um, the hospital has been kind enough and gracious enough to, to be able to allow us to do same day consents so that we're able to do the consent forms a day of so in case we do a telemedicine uh, consult and it results in a surgical uh, uh, decision making. So um, lots of ways, obviously all the staff is using PPE, um, as well. So it, uh, you know, we do have COVID positive patients that have to come in and be seen because we do trauma and fracture care. What we do with those patients is we limit, um, uh, we limit the number of people that interact with that patient. So it might be that I don't have my PA see that patient. I'll go see them myself because ultimately I have to see that patient anyway. Uh, obviously we have, if we know they're COVID positive, we'll do a full PPE. We also schedule those patients at the end of the day um, so that uh, there, again, the exposure risk is very limited to other patients. Uh, we also, obviously, every room gets deep cleaned uh, after each visit, um, especially after we, it's a known COVID, COVID positive patient. Um, we are seeing, as we just to, to be complete and complete the COVID picture, we are preoperatively testing all of our patients for COVID. They must get a COVID test three days before surgery. That's our, that's our time frame right now. So for a Monday surgery, they have to have a COVID test Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, and they have to be COVID negative uh, three days before surgery for them to have surgery. If they come back COVID positive as part of their routine workup, there's two options. Option one is to cancel their surgery and we make them wait four weeks. Four weeks after a positive COVID test, our institution actually does not even require another test. They are treated like a COVID negative patient. So the, we just wait and make them wait four weeks. And if it's something elective, like a total knee or total hip, they just have to wait four weeks after a positive COVID test and they can come in for a surgery. And they don't even need a new COVID test at that point. If it's something urgent or emergent that needs to be done that can't wait four weeks, a fracture for instance, and if we waited four weeks would be detrimental to the patient's outcome, then typically we will schedule that patient into the COVID room. And for the hospital, we like to get our elective COVID cases done as first cases uh, because it does require additional resources in the hospital to do a COVID patient. We have multiple nurses, one in the room, one out of the room so that there's no back and forth going on. Um, similarly for anesthesia, they've got a tech that's, you know, they've got a CRNA or an attending in the room, but they don't want those people leaving back and forth. So they have to have another person uh, situated outside of the room. So they are, it is resource intensive. So we do, uh, we do require that uh, COVID uh, positive patients go first in the day. So that has been um, part of the testing process. Incidentally, our positive COVID rate for the asymptomatic patient is less than 1%. I believe it's around 0.5%. So of the elective surgeries that we are scheduling, um, of less than 0.5% of patients are testing positive for COVID where they were asymptomatic or didn't know. Um, so it, uh, it, it has had a small impact, but not as much as I thought, given some of the numbers that I'm hearing uh, that are um, out there right now. Uh, and so it's been um, definitely been a transition. It's been a learning experience for us. Um, you know, I do disaster management work uh, as part of my trauma practice. And, uh, but this is a different, and, and most of that work is focused on natural disasters. I did a, a, some time in Haiti after the earthquake there about a decade ago. Uh, and I've been to other sites where there has been um, there's been some you know, mass casualty type or, or or natural sort of natural destructive type type events. Um, this is a different kind of situation, I think. Uh, still, 
requires some uh, amount of damage control or, or damage control principles, but it's a much more prolonged process than say a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake or something like that. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a, a learning process for I think many because we haven't really experienced this uh, uh, in our lifetimes quite this way in North America. There's other parts of the world that have clearly done this and done this unfortunately several times, uh, but in North America, uh, we have it at the U.S., uh, Toronto, Canada had SARS uh, prior to COVID. So for us in the U.S., it's been um, a little bit of a learning experience uh, in terms of how to do this and how to manage uh, patients. Uh, I think for healthcare professionals, it's also been uh, a time where they've had that opportunity to reflect uh, and sort of look at uh, how, uh, how, um, how they've been able to sort of act and react. Um, we learned a lot from New York. Uh, at least in our area, we took lessons they learned in New York and applied them to what we were doing in an effort to really limit um, what happened in the hospitals in New York to try and limit what happened uh, there in terms of Philadelphia. So um, I don't see any more questions about COVID um, or lipus. Um, so with that, uh, I think we're going to wrap up. I know it's been a long day for everybody and you're probably looking to, to sort of get to your Friday. Uh, so we appreciate your time. We hope that this was an educational experience for everyone. Um, there will be some questions related to this event that will be coming to you along with your credit uh, from your CME. So look for that in your email. Uh, if you do have any other questions that come up as time goes on, I think all of the speakers today would be more than happy if you reached out to us, more than happy to answer any questions you might have, uh, both about fracture care, arthroplasty, uh, biologics, um, or like us. And so uh, with that, I uh, wish you all to be safe, healthy. Don't touch your face and please wash your hands. Take care.